Hey friendos, it's me, not Keith. Just want to let you know this retrospective is going to be spoiler heavy for all of Amphibia. This includes the recent series finale, so if you haven't watched it, how? Go and do that because that show slaps. Then come back here and watch this cool video essay I made. But anyways, let's go! So about a month ago, the final episode of Amphibia aired and... Changed my life! And you've changed mine. Goodbye, Sprig. Come on, Nan. You'll be okay. It's okay. Saving this world was the best decision I've ever made. Well, I'm good. I'm not gonna cry again. I pinky promise. But it was a very emotional end to the series that I really enjoyed, and the reason I enjoyed it are more than skin deep. So I just wanted to talk about all the reasons why I love Amphibia, and why I think it is so important. So, it's no big deal, my Amphibia Retrospective. If you know my channel, you know that I do a lot when it comes to analyzing how being Asian is portrayed in Western media. So guess what we're going to talk about first? Oh yeah, that's right boys, you thought this was me going to just talk about how I think this is the best Western anime since Avatar The Last Airbender? Um, heck no. Joke's on you bro, we first have to talk about the importance of Asian representation in this cartoon, because Asian representation in cartoons has been a mixed bag since I was a kid. And Amphibia creator Matt Braley thought the same thing. Matt Braley is Thai American, and here is what he said about the importance of Anne being Thai American. It was phenomenally important, it was almost the most important thing, Anne has always been Thai. From the very inception of the project, she was always going to be Thai. And it was something that where when I was growing up, there just wasn't any kind of Southeast Asian representation on screen, whether that's animated or not. So I remember as a kid desperately seeking it out. I would watch these 90s Mortal Kombat films a lot because it was filmed in Atayu, Thailand, just because there were some ruins that looked cool for that sort of movie. I would also watch The King and I. I was very desperate to connect with my heritage because my mother would be like, oh, you're Thai. And I'd be like, what does that mean? And she'd be like, well, you know, I can't explain. For me, as a creator, having this Thai character was almost a number one priority for me so that other kids like me growing up could look at the TV screen and be like, hey, it's me, or hey, I'm there too. I think something this specific was only going to be done by someone who had Thai background. The reason this quote and explanation is so impactful to me is because Matt and I are around the same age and he's maybe a couple years older than I am, and he was right. I'm not Thai, but I am from a Southeast Asian country, I'm actually Filipino. But the lack of Asian representation we got was very staggering, and even when we did, it wasn't really the best. Even if there were Asian characters, a lot of them were regulated to side characters. The one thing that is super dope about Amphibia is the fact that yes, Anne is Thai American, but that's not the central focus. Now let me explain, so we have had shows with Asian leads as the center of the focus. But a lot of them were also made by white dudes who exoticized Eastern cultures for the magical and fantasy elements. I mean, look at things like American Dragon Jake Long, Shaolin Showdown, and Jackie Chan Adventures. So as much as I don't think any of these shows are extremely bad at portraying Asian characters, per se, you know, besides Omi straight up being aggressively yellow and having the most ching chongy voice I've ever heard, being voiced by Twilight Sparkle, Yes! In your head, Ramundo! In your face! Talk to my fingers! And okay, yeah, Jake Long is using an aggressive black scent way before Aquafina ever did. I would say these shows were successful with kids. Before I go in, I'm not saying these shows are bad and racist and should not exist. I mean, Omi probably shouldn't, but it's too late now. He lives in my head rent free and haunts my subconscious. And I thoroughly love Jackie Chan Adventures. The man it's based on as a person, eh, not so much. 
What I'm trying to put out there is that they always felt like the Asian cultures they were using were only there for the sake of pushing a mystic subplot. And there is nothing necessarily bad about that because an argument can be made that things recently like Shang-Chi and Turning Red do that exact same thing. But where those two differ is the context of the use, right? Shang-Chi and Turning Red use their mystical plot points as a conversation piece that pushes the narrative of the main conflict between parent and child, and their identity of being Asian isn't exoticized, but it's still a main focus of the plot. Whereas the shows that I have mentioned use it to be like, oh look, this sick Asian adjacent thing we made up is pretty cool, so magical, so Asian, so wow. So Matt Braley uses his identity of being Thai American as the basis to the world of Amphibia as well. He said this in that same interview I used talking about Asian representation. I got to thinking a lot about my childhood trips to Bangkok, Thailand. My mother is Thai, and every summer, she would fly me over with herself, of course, to Bangkok to meet and visit with my Thai side of the family. As a California kid, it really was like being transported to a completely different world. It was so different. The culture, the food, the humidity, that hits you like a brick wall when you get off the airplane. I remember very distinctly being very uncomfortable at the beginning of these trips, but then like magic, I would slowly but surely fall in love with the place, and then by the end of the trip, I didn't want to leave. So it was that kind of magic, that emotional sensation, that I was looking to bottle up for Amphibia. You've got this teenage girl, Anne, who's transported to this crazy frog world, and you better believe she's going to have an uncomfortable time at first. Maybe not love it so much, but then over the course of the first season, she will slowly but surely fall in love with the place. The reason I bring this up is to say that yes, Matt Braley was heavily inspired by his time in Bangkok as the basis of the plot and feeling of Amphibia, but he didn't turn Amphibia to an exotic Asian land. Instead, it was a world that felt more like in Western fantasy, but with gross slimy lizards. This is also not saying that Anne being Thai isn't important, because there are bits and pieces at first where she talks about her heritage. There is an entire episode devoted to Anne showing off different kind of amphibia food with a Thai twist. And this is kind of a reflection of how homesick Anne is. Plus in flashbacks and when she is interacting with her mom, her mom just switches from English to Thai like it's no big deal or when she's upset. That stuff was really cool to me because my mom did that a lot too. And when they visited the small Thai community in her city, Anne wasn't a big fan of going because she felt she was too old and growing up. But with the planner, she slowly starts to love and respect that the little Thai community she's got to grow up in. In fact, Anne's look was heavily inspired by this amazing photo of my grandmother when she was a little girl. She has this wild, untamable hair and this fierce look. I'm half Thai, and it's so important for me to voice a character who is Thai herself. There are little bits and pieces of her heritage that come through. Really fun to be able to kind of show and talk about dishes that I grew up eating and getting to share that with the audience and hoping to open up their eyes to new things. You know, it's what I grew up doing, so I hope that everyone enjoys it and they, they learn something new. And... and I see this stuff now as an adult, and I'm glad my mom made me go to Filipino American parties as a way to connect with my heritage and meet other Filipino kids. Because growing up in a small town in Iowa, there really weren't that many of us. There are all just these subtle things that show up Anne's Thai heritage without being like, look at me, I'm Asian. And people who know me or watch my channel know I love this kind of representation. It's not overt and over the top. I like that nuanced shit. Speaking of which, if you made it this far in the video, you should like, subscribe, and share. But at the same time, Anne is Thai, but she's Thai American. And they show that as well. She loves romance films, K-pop, and other stuff typical American kids her age would like. She is the definition of a true Asian American kid, shaped by culture she was from and the country that raised her. The only other time I felt like this with Asian characters was the episode of All Grown Up when Kimmy was finding her Japanese heritage, and in the show 16 with Jonesy and Nikki being Asian, but they're just teens hanging out in a Canadian mall. Also, just shout out to the fact that Matt Braley didn't make Anne's parents tiger parents. They want to understand Understand their daughter and Anne's dad is just a huge fucking nerd playing MMORPGs on his free time. One of my favorite parts is that the series three main human leads are all voiced by Asian women and I think that's pretty awesome. Brenda Song, who is also Thai American, voices Anne. Sasha is voiced by Anna Ankana, who is a mix of Japanese and Filipino, and Marcy Wu is voiced by Haley Shu, who is of Chinese and Indonesian descent. 
With Sasha, it technically doesn't matter because she's just your stereotypical white girl, but for Anne and Marcy, because they are different cultures, I'm really glad that they got people who are Asian to voice Asian characters. Because like, I'm going to be real, if I had to hear another white lady or dude do the Ching Chong Bing Bong voice, I was gonna have a brain aneurysm. So I really am hitting hard on this as my first part of why I think Amphibia is important is because I am Asian and I love that we're seeing so much of this positive Asian representation that gives us nuance and more of a portrayal of Asians in the media. We aren't being portrayed as your perpetual foreigners anymore, but as Asian Americans raised in a different culture but shaped by American values we grew up in. This entire part comes first because A, this part talking about being Asian in cartoons was going to be its own video, but Anne just is the pinnacle of that evolution to me, and my channel does have a focus on representation and why it matters to Asian kids in the media. And I also know a lot of other retrospectives and reviews of this show I feel won't talk about the nuances of the portrayal of the Asian identity in media, and I don't expect them to. It's just for me that this is the biggest reason why I love Amphibia so much though. I like knowing that nowadays Asian kids can see themselves in media besides being a nerd or good at karate. We are just people like everyone else and we can do amazing things too. So I want to lighten the mood because I think the ending part also gets really deep and emotional, at least for me, talking about my love for the story and themes in it. Amphibia is a pretty cool show when it comes to homage and references. Like, I think the medium of meta commentary about things has gotten so muddled and shitty because I genuinely feel like most of this stuff is just in your face like, yo dog, do you remember like New Coke or look at this obscure world based on that one movie and let me tell you about it. I'm looking at you, Rick and Morty and Stranger Things. I just find it more charming when you can reference a certain source of media without straight up telling me what it is. Amphibia to me, I think, does this kind of referential stuff very well. Amphibia was able to make references to some horror movies, and one of them is the staple of the 2000s, while the other one was just a recent. So in the horror anthology episode Amphibia, they do a ring parody using TikTok. And there's an entire homage to Midsummer in a season 3 episode. Say what you want, I think the Midsommar reference is a deep cut and obviously children aren't gonna know that, but as an adult who watched that movie and had it mentally break me a little bit, I kinda winced, but also was like, wow, I can't believe they got away with that. That's pretty awesome. But where the biggest homages come from is in anime and video games. You can tell how much Matt Braley was inspired by his love for anime. Amphibia is an isekai. An isekai is a subgenre of fantasy in which a character is suddenly transported from their world into a new or unfamiliar one. It's a common trope found in a lot of modern animes we see today. Look at ReZero, that time I got reincarnated into a slime, and all of these. Digimon is one of the OGs and the best isekai to exist, don't at me, because you are wrong. I think one of the coolest ways Amphibia uses the isekai trope is that it allows us to experience all the weird and crazy stuff with Anne while she's first experiencing them as well. So although it's common for cute caterpillar kitties to exist, Anne has no clue that they transform into a horrifying eldritch being and that there is a sort of segregation between newts, toads, and frogs in this world. It allows us, the audience, to see how this already established world works, but it wears a ton of its influence just on its sleeve. One of them is Magical Knight Ray Earth. It was an isekai about three high school girls going to a mystical fantasy land. I mean, even the final designs of their calamity powers harkens back to the Magical Knight Ray Earth. But you can tell that anime influenced all parts of Amphibia, from Anne going Super Saiyan with her calamity powers, to some of the adventures they go on to, to the sick ass Gundam mech Andreas has at the end fight. But like anime, another thing that has inspired Amphibia is Matt's love for video games, specifically Sonic and The Legend of Zelda. A lot of the Frobots in the later half of the series are inspired by a bunch of Eggbot enemies from the Sonic games, and the mythos of the three powerful gems very much harkens back to The Legend of Zelda, as well as the fantasy setting having a feel of Hyrule and Breath of the Wild. Even the final climax harkens back to the final climax of Majora's Mask, with a giant moon plummeting down to Earth. What I love about how they use these inspirations is that they add stuff to the world. Like yeah, these things are inspired by Sonic and Dragon Ball, but Amphibia has its own personality and the references make the world feel fresh. Which leads me into the world of Amphibia is awesome because it feels lived in. 
All the different parts of amphibia they visit all feel different from each other. The frogs live in a more agricultural environment, the toads live in a Mad Max and more barren lands, and the newts live in royal and regal areas. And you notice all this with subtlety and it's not in your face how this amphibian society works with frogs being a lower class citizen, and you feel like Anne's slowly finding out the mystery of amphibia. The fantasy elements are strong in this world, but it doesn't feel like you're just in a high fantasy isekai concept you see a lot in anime, but there's a combination of elements of steampunk and futurism as well. Home. So I want to end this video talking about the story of Amphibia because at the core of the story it's aggressively relatable. It's about identity. Throughout the story, you the audience is watching Anne grow and become the person she wants to be. At the beginning of the story, Anne is a follower. Her two best friends have traits that allow them to be themselves and will help them in their life. Marcy is intelligent and Sasha has a headstrong attitude. And then there is Anne who is more of a follower and doesn't have a drive of her own, at least that's what her principal tells her, that she wants in her future. You find out before she went to Amphibia that she was tasked to write an essay about who she is. And you don't find this out till the tail end of season 3 so what we are seeing is Anne's journey of self discovery. So moments like her choosing to stand up to Sasha to protect her found family and choosing to sacrifice her own life to save the world that she loves is growth for Anne's journey. And after sacrificing her life to save the world, the god of the gems asked her to take their place as the new god because she was the only one in eons to not use the gems power for selfish reasons. And she declines because she knows she's just a 13 year old kid and isn't perfect and will make mistakes. But no matter what, she will keep growing from them. Anne's arc of who she wants to be will never technically be finished, but she knows the way she wants to go. You find out at the end that her time in Amphibia inspired her to become a herpetologist and has an entire Amphibian exhibit called Amphibia with cases that look like places she went to in Amphibia and her favorite frog is named after her best friend Sprig. Although yes, it feels like Anne's story is a hero of prophecy and that's what they're pushing to the point where it's shown throughout the series, the series isn't really about destiny, but it's a story about Anne growing up and finding who she wants to be. This idea hits home when Anne sings the song, It's No Big Deal, and it's a song literally about her arc and growth coming to Amphibia. With Bros also comes the hard truth that people you were close to sometimes end up drifting apart. Amphibia shows this both symbolically and literally. At the end of the show, Anne had to permanently leave Amphibia and never see it again. But as you see through the time skip, the people she affected still think highly of her and the adventures they did together mean something. And then they show the 10 year time skip in the human world between the trio of girls. After Marcy moved away, Anne and Sasha, although still hung around each other and liked each other, they both drifted apart because they didn't share a lot of interests as they grew up. But then you see when they have a 10 year meetup that that didn't mean that they weren't still friends. There was still a strong connection and bond between them all. The thing I really wanted to hit hard in this concept is why I think this show's story and arc is important is because of the fact that I'm a 20 or 8 year old grown man being like, yo, this is a cool show. I wish I had this kind of stuff when I was watching cartoons as a kid. And I talk about this being impactful because someone who is close to me is around the age of Anne and is one of the target audience for this show. We talk about this show and I can always tell how much they love this show. Kids need shows like this to let them know they don't have to have it all figured out and you are growing and you are always gonna make mistakes but learn from it and that's all that matters. This show and other modern shows like The Owl House is important because of the fact that they are shows that are showing people of color being represented as leads and having their own personalities, as well as showing LGBTQ representation. Owl House is far better at that, but the small nods we get in Amphibia is important as well. I think I want to end this video is with my title is being called It's No Big Deal because I love that song. But I think Amphibia is a big deal because I see this as a milestone and a show that has helped and will help push more stories like this. Not a fantastical fantasy story, but a story about minority leads getting a chance to be shown. Amphibia is an amazing show because of all these things and it's so important and worth the watch. Hey guys, thanks for watching my video. I know it's been like a month or so since I've posted a video. I've just been real busy and I've been wanting to write this Amphibia video essay since the start of season three and this show has got me really emotional and I just had to like unpack it because I didn't want to just come out willy nilly with something. So I hope you enjoyed the video and as always keep on keeping on and whatever you're going through you've got this cowboy.